I'd like to welcome the show Ken Atchity, man. How are you doing, sir? Good. How are you doing? Very good. Nice to be with you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on the show. I truly appreciate it. I know you're a busy man, so thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. So before we get started, how did you get started in the business? Uh, well, in, in show business, I got started because I was a professor uh, working with stories, mm-hmm. analyzing stories and helping people construct stories and, of course, writing my own stories. And I just decided that I wanted to be uh, on the other side of the coin, so to speak. I didn't want to be on the critical side. I wanted to be on the, you know, the making side mm-hmm. and get stories out to the world, both as a, in publishing and in film. Uh, and television. So I came up with an idea that ended up being 16 movies and in the rest was history. I just uh, went on from there. Very cool. Now, in your opinion, you, you obviously focus a lot on story. Uh, what makes a good story in your opinion? Well, uh, what makes a good story is, is the reader or the audience not being able to forget the story. I mean, that's the ultimate test of a great story, I think. And uh, that it really changes their lives in some way. It either it really entertains them or it, it teaches them or shows them something memorable mm-hmm. that they have a hard time forgetting. To me, that's the main, you know, the main uh, symptom of a good story. Now, is that focusing more on plot, on, you know, the structure? Is that talking about character or is it a combination? Like, what are some of the elements of you know, a good it, story? It's a combination, but the, but the primary thing is character. Okay. You know, creating an unforgettable character, um, one of the signs of that is that, that people will start telling you things about the story that didn't even happen in the story because they, they, they got the character so well that they you know, imagine the character in other settings. So I think the number one important thing is a good character, what we call the protagonist, mm-hmm. who is the first actor in the story and who uh, makes the story happen uh, based on a need of theirs and then has to go out and somehow battle against an antagonist, you know, obstacles to that need and accomplish it or uh, tragically not being able to accomplish it by the end of the story. In your opinion, what does make a good uh, a good uh, protagonist? Well, generally speaking, it's it's a flawed human being. It's somebody that we can immediately relate to because of uh, some problem that they're having. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my favorite examples is Lethal Weapon. Yeah. Uh, you know, Riggs. Mel Gibson being a homicidal, you know, homicide detective and a suicidal homicide detective. <laughs> That's kind of hard to forget. Um, so in the, one of the opening scenes, he's actually playing Russian roulette um, as he wakes up in the morning and, and swigs a cold beer and then, you know, puts the gun to his head. Uh, but, it, you know, he, he's, he survives that day and goes on to another day. But you immediately can't forget him. He, a guy who goes out and does his duty um, despite the fact that he wants to kill himself uh, because his wife had been recently killed, et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, it, there are all kinds of memorable characters like Rain Man and, mm-hmm. um, you know, Silver Linings Playbook. That you, you, you just go from one to the other, but it's usually the characters that you remember. Yeah, I never. I mean, there are obviously very good plots. You know, I remember you know Usual Suspects being you know has the the plot was so amazing. But generally speaking, it is character that drives. Like that's what you really connect to because they're the human beings that you're connecting to. That's something you can actually hold on to. Correct. Right, and and one of the observations that you have in the in the film business is that the character is great. The plot is replaceable, so mm-hmm. that that's what leads you. I, I, I specialized recently in selling book lines, line you know books that my clients have written, several on the same characters, and making them into series. So we're heavily involved in setting up series, and what buyers in Hollywood are trying to buy is they're trying to buy the characters. You know, they they buy the characters, and they can go on making movies or episodes about those characters without reference to the plots that the original author came up with. Sometimes they use this plot. Sometimes the writers, you know, the television writers or the film writers just make up their own plots to go with that character. Are you, are you, um, when you're consulting your clients now, are you recommending that they, if you're writing a book, let's say that you're, you're not just writing one book that you're writing series of books based off the same character, kind of like a Sherlock Holmes or, 
you know, or, you know, uh, Jack Ryan or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I end up doing that because I, I kind of the ultimate home run from a financial point of view for a writer is to sell a television series. Um, and, and so one of my writers <clears throat> took the train in to see me the other day and we sat there at lunch and he'd done, he'd done two novels already that were pretty good. And I told him he should start thinking about, you know, writing another novel using the same character. And uh, I did that a couple of years ago with another writer, Texan, and uh, he's now written three books with the same character that caught my attention. And I, I took it out to a pitch meeting with the major producer a few weeks ago, and I, I could pitch it in two sentences. And the minute he heard about the character, he said, that's an obvious series. Let's let's do it. So we're partnered on on the series just because he heard about the character and the world the character finds himself in. So th that's obviously a, a good reason to write more than one novel on the same character, not to mention the fact that you're much more likely to sell multiple copies of your novel if you have several other novels that somebody can read with the same character. Yeah, I, I, I recently uh, got, I was I recently found a show called Bosch, which is uh, based on Michael Conley's uh, series of books. My right. God, it's so well done. So well Isn't written. It? And the character is, he's such an interest. the Bosch character is so interesting because he's, he's a flawed human being. But yet he's not Indiana Jones. He's not Sherlock Holmes. He's not superhuman by any stretch. But yet you're just drawn in. And obviously it's the actor, but the character itself and the world that they that, that Michael created, it is fascinating. And I'm seeing that because of all the streaming series. And there's so much opportunity for filmmakers and for and for writers out there now. Uh, I mean, we are pretty much in the, a gold rush of story at this time. Yeah. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, look at Breaking Bad and oh, yeah. and, and and Luther and uh, you know the, the the Escape from Connemara, mm -hmm. you know, limited series. But it's the characters that that draw you into it. Um, you know, the the plot isn't that important. I mean, if you think about Bosch, like how many plots can you remember right away? Um, it's it, it hard takes to me. It the takes plots. me a minute. It takes me a minute to to rem I like. I have to go back. I season one. He had to do this. Season three. He had to do that. But it's Bosch. It's like Indiana Jones. Like you know, you, you you know, it's 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 James Bond. Like how you know how many plots of James Bond do you remember? But boy, you remember James Bond pretty clearly. Yeah, exactly. And and sometimes to show how how the plot is harder to remember, they'll put the plot in the title. You mm -hmm. know, the Temple of Dune or Raiders <laughs> of the Lost Ark, just in case you you forget, because you're not going to forget Indiana Jones mm -hmm. or James Bond. So you they you know call his books after his villains because they're the ones you have to think about to remember goldfinger and you know uh dr no etc right uh, but you don't need to be reminded about james bond that's why you're reading the book or watching the movie so in today's world that we have such a huge uh opportunity for writers uh to be able to put you know write content and create content do you recommend instead of going after possibly a screenplay, which is a one-off, to actually focus on series, to focus on limited series? Is that where the marketplace is kind of leaning now? Because there's just so much need and want for original content now. Is that a, a smart move as a writer? Uh, yeah, it's definitely a smart move. It's it's a little, little more difficult move, but it's a smart move because we have so many channels demanding programming Mm -hmm. that it's hugely competitive. I mean, new, you know, broadcasters are born every year, whether it's Hulu and Apple recently or Amazon and Netflix, the generation before, or, you know, in the old days, the HBOs and Showtimes and even older days, the networks, that they're all competing for, you know, stories and, and, and series. One of the biggest decisions we have to make when we go out with a a series is whether it should be a, a network series or a cable series um, because of the difference in content, obviously. But but clearly that's it's not only it's not only easier to sell a series in this demanding market, but it's also it's also the smarter way to go because honestly the smartest writers and the best writers have all gravitated to television. Television, you know, years ago, 15, 20 years ago, was regarded as kind of a wasteland, mm -hmm. um, a no man's land. And it was very hard f for a, fe a feature writer to even want to go into television 
And now it's just normal that television is dying for feature writers and rating feature writers. And more importantly, the feature writers are starting to write original stuff for television because it's so difficult to set up a, a movie by comparison. Movies are still being made and huge numbers are being made, but not by the studios. The studios are limiting what they do to four or five movies a year where they used to do 30 or 40. Uh, and, and so the explosion of growth there is in independent films, but an independent film can have a very long road to production because of the uncertainty of financing and the distributor's reluctance to actually put them in theaters compared to the big blockbuster from, you know, Disney or from Warner Brothers. Uh, so altogether, television is a much friendlier and smarter environment for writers, I think, to, to um, aspire to. Do you agree with what Spielberg said about the implosion of Hollywood, where this this whole new Hollywood, the studio system specifically, which is just blockbuster after blockbuster after blockbuster, that eventually one of these is going to pop. We're, we're, there's going to be a studio that's not going to be able to take a $500 million hit, and they're just going to go under, and it's going to be kind of like this bubble that's going to pop eventually. Do you agree with that? Because, I mean, it is riskier and riskier and riskier. As I mean, we're talking about... I remember when Titanic came out and everyone was like, $200 million budget. Everyone was like insane. I remember when a $100 million budget was a lot of money. Now, right. now we're talking $300, $350 million budgets and plus marketing. So we're talking half a billion dollars to make a billion and a half dollars. What do you... I just a curiosity, just from, a, from your perspective. Well, it's complicated. If, if he were... You know, if he were talking strictly about movie making, mm -hmm. it would be easy to agree with that. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, studios don't make most of their money from movie making. Uh, a studio head of a studio had something lunch with him one day, and he said, "Don't don't ever accuse me of being a filmmaker. I am a toy salesman who makes films to advertise my toys, and, and most of the money that's made by any of the big studios is in merchandising. Mm -hmm. And so, hopefully, if they have a $300 million bust, they'll be making it up from, you know, the $500 million they're making on another movie or even on the merchandising from the failed movie because there's no end to it. And, and plus, the studios are generally owned by international conglomerates, and those conglomerates are heavily invested in real estate. You know, the one of the reasons they buy the studio is for its real estate. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I don't quite agree with him that that's going to happen easily, but it certainly could happen. If a studio made three bad judgments a year um, and all three were upside down, uh, it would be difficult for them to survive it. And they do, though. I mean, they do. Paramount has survived that several times. Oh, and, uh, yeah. you know, it, it's sad. I mean, DreamWorks has not really quite survived it. So they end up being more or less part of, you know, Universal and uh that's basically the fate of studios is being acquired by another studio as Fox was just acquired by Disney, which still blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Fox was such a distinctive studio and so was Disney. The fact that they're owned now in by the same conglomerate is just very upsetting and weird. It just, you know, narrows the number of places I can sell the movies, you know, my clients movies. Yeah. With, without question. And, um, yeah, it, it it it's a it's a weird world that we're living in. I think there the, the 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 amount of stories that are being told, the channels are are smaller at the big at the highest levels. It used to be many more studios, many more things, but uh, I think we could thank um, George Lucas for all this merchandising because he was basically yeah. the first one to really to 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 do it. Honestly, I mean they did merchandising prior to George Lucas, but no one's done it as good as he has um, from that point. Yeah, I think no one kind of focused on it the way he did. From the very beginning, he was he recognized the value of the merchandising. In fact, you know, the, the story is that that Fox, who financed Star Wars, wasn't as interested in the merchandising as they were in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that story is true or not, but it's it is a, a legendary story. Uh, yes. It's, and now, you know, now the Disney has acquired the franchise, you know, they're very careful to continue the toys because that's where Walt Disney made all of his money is, you know, from the Mickey Mouse t-shirts and Mickey Mouse dolls and all of those other characters. Um, 
sitting on the shelves like like they are in the background of of your office there. Yes, uh, my Yoda, Yoda. my <laughs> all yeah. that kind of stuff back there. Right. Now, can you discuss a few pitfalls to watch out for on the business side of of storytelling? Because I think storytellers are artists. We're you know filmmakers. We're just artists. We don't want to think about business or you know or distribution or let somebody else deal with that. What are some pitfalls that we should look at in this new world that we're walking into and that we're in currently? But I think that the 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 two avenues between business show and business are really starting to cross a lot more than before. So are there any pitfalls that you can kind of uh, help, help us watch out for? Yeah. My, my second last book was called, uh, you know, <clears throat> sell your story to Hollywood, a, a writer's handbook to the business of show business. Mm -hmm. And I always tell my clients that the more they know about business, the better, the better they're going to be in terms of being in this business and making a living out of it. Um, and, and people, like you said, they're not that they're not that interested in the business part of it. But uh, to me, the most upsetting uh, situation for a writer that they should be looking out for is what's called reversion. Uh, and that means that you sell your story, you get some money up front, which is option payment. You even may get the rights payment that occurs on the day of principal photography. But if something happens three weeks into that and the movie never gets finished, never gets shot, uh, your movie, your story, which was brilliant enough to get somebody to invest a lot of money in it and to raise money for it, is suddenly in limbo. And I can't tell you how many wonderful stories I've sold in the past that are in limbo and are likely to stay there. There's one in particular that a new finance group approached me a few months ago and said, we want to make this movie. We almost almost made it 10 years ago, if you'll recall. And yes, I do recall it because we sold it to a distributor and now it's in what's called turnaround, which means that the distributor has its, its claws on the story and they will not release it to another financer without the financer paying not only how much money that studio had put into it, but also 10% interest a year since then. So it ends up being a ton of money, like 50 times the amount of money that they actually spend on it because of the interest. And, uh, and that story basically is, you know, can be gone forever in this limbo state. And, and it's something to really look at to make sure that your attorney, your agent, your manager, uh, has got a strong reversion clause that says something to the effect that if your movie is not made within five years of of the you know the 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 date it was contracted for, that it will revert free and clear to you as opposed to go into turnaround where the studio can hold it up you know for for money. And God, we must have a dozen great stories in that situation. And it's, it's a huge thing to worry about. And of course, the other thing is to make sure that if you're a writer, especially of an animated film, that you are getting a true part of the back end of the story, meaning the profits of, of the movie. Um, you know, they so rarely does that happen in Hollywood that those points, as they're called, are, are referred to as monkey points, because I suppose only a monkey would believe that they're actually going to get those points. But if you have a really good attorney, uh, there are things you can do to make sure that doesn't happen. And people don't really think about this on their first two or three deals. But after those deals, especially after something has happened to show them what they might have made had they had a better deal, you know, they'll they will get smart about it. And we try to educate our writers. And in fact, in that real fast Hollywood deal that we do um, online, it's a course on how to succeed in the business of show business, not just, you know, not, not just the show part, but the business part. Mm -hmm. And people do. I mean, obviously, people like Lucas and Spielberg uh, have done pretty well for themselves because they, they went to business school and, and learned the business part of it. Yeah, I, I, was, I was told um, years ago when I was meeting with an agent that uh, he's like, when I'm looking for a creative, a writer or, or a director, I'm looking for three people. I'm looking for a politician. I'm looking for an artist and I'm looking for a businessman. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and isn't that it, I think that was really great. Uh, in, it was a great window into what really is needed in this business. 
you know, and is it, it, those three things. Because if you, you if you have just one of those, it won't work. You have to have yeah. all three. Because a lot of people yeah. don't talk about the politics behind the scenes. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. Yeah. No, it, it is mostly, it is 90% of the effort. It's dealing with the people, dealing with the business. And honestly, uh, when they say that creativity is, you know, creative ideas are a dime a dozen, that isn't literally true, but um, maybe a quarter a dozen. You know, there, there are lots and lots of ideas and they never make it to the screen unless you have those other qualities of business and, you know, political savvy, how to deal with people. Because, you know, there's a there's a, a, a set of rules about how to operate in Hollywood. And one of them um, is being a fun person to work with and staying off of everyone's life is too short list. That's a great, I like that. I like, I like that term. Life is too, I've heard of the life is too short, but I've never ca- heard it called the life is too short list. Uh, yeah. I, in one of my books, I, I talk about it and what it takes to get on that list. And at a certain point, no matter how creative you are and how brilliant your ideas are, nobody wants to hear from you. Right. And even, yeah. and, and even some of these legendary directors uh, and writers for that matter, that, that are super talented and they win Oscars and they make lots of money, but they're just horrible human beings or horrible to work with. The moment they stumble, it's over. The, yeah. the second they trip up, the second they, they stumble, it goes, it, they, they never get to, they never get back in. And, but if you're a super nice guy, you know, like I use Ron Howard all the time because Ron Howard's such an amazing filmmaker and he's had, He's had really strong bombs in his career, but he's mm-hmm. also had really strong hits. But he's, I heard so many good things from, about working with yeah, him. Yeah, everybody likes him. You know, he returns people's phone calls. He's always nice. He doesn't show his the arrogance that he uh, deserves. Mm-hmm. He doesn't act like it. You know, he's, he's humble because whatever the reason is, his character it was not destroyed by success. And too often early success can destroy character and um i try to tell my writers that when they fail a few times that they're actually building character so that they'll do better uh you know in the long run i i call it shrapnel it's like you need a little shrapnel you need a little scarring you know to toughen yourself up and to kind of go through this business yeah that's right it's absolutely right now, can you can storytellers in today's world make a living with their stories and if there is what are some other ways that storytellers could make money with their business, with their, with their stories besides just, you know, trying to pitch a studio or, or, you know, at the larger levels, or do you have any advice on like what other writers could be doing to sell their stories or make money with their stories? Well, of course, because of the internet and Amazon in particular, um, everyone can, you know, publish books that used to have to go through gatekeepers, mostly in New York to get to that point. Um, <clears throat> and, Hollywood is in love with books. So if you're going to try to sell a story to Hollywood, the best possible advice I can give you is to write it as a book first. And um, in the old days, Hollywood used to insist that it be from a major publisher, but that's all changed in the last 20 years. And um, I discovered about 10 years ago that I was having a much harder time sell books, selling books to New York than I used to. Um, I used to sell 30 or 40 books a year and to all the publishers, but then they were always, they were also bought up by the big conglomerates. So every major publisher of which there used to be about 50, they've now gotten down to about four. And those four have purchased the other 36 imprints and made them part of their, you know, their big flags um, because they're owned by Heschet and Bertelsmann and Penguin Putnam and so on. And, um, as a result, they don't buy new voices the way they used to. They're not interested in unknown writers the way they used to be. So I got upset about that because I didn't have as many books to take to my Hollywood lunches. And I decided about eight years ago now to start our own imprint, Story Merchant Books, of which we've now published over 300. And uh, and, and I set up a whole bunch of them as series and as uh, movies uh, because they look like books and they talk like books and they sound like books. And so people go, I got to read this. And I, I take the book to lunch with me and they go home with it and read it and call me in a few days and say they, they want to make it into a movie. Uh, so any any writer can do that. They can 
put out, you know, go to, to Amazon and print their books or they can come to a company that helps them do that, like one of mine does. Um, and, and that's a huge thing they can do. And of course, they can also edit and help other writers. And um, a lot of writers you know, make a steady income by doing that. But uh, there are more opportunities, I think, than ever before to make a living as a writer. And do you, and like, again, today's world that we have so much opportunity in the streaming space, in the streaming space specifically, do you recommend that screenwriters begin to create their own video content to create a pilot or create, instead of walking in with a, just a pitch to walk in with a sizzle reel or a scene or, or even a full blown pilot that they shot, you know, for 15 or 20 grand to, you know, as a proof of concept, um, or like in, was it, it's always sunny in, in Philadelphia, that basically, that's exactly what they did. They shot a pilot and then went off to do, I think, four or five seasons with that with that pilot, with the same actors, I think, even. They just added a few more bigger names. So what do you think? I think it's a visual medium. And if, if you know how to do it, uh, then by all means, that's what you should be doing because that's what we're all looking for. We're looking for movies, you know, for moving pictures. And uh, I have a client who kind of behind my back, he was a business not, business writer and I had sold two of his business books. And then out of the blue, he told me a couple of years ago, you know, I decided to make a dream of mine come true. I made a movie. And he, he I couldn't believe it because he seemed like not the, the complete opposite of a guy who would make a movie because he was a button down businessman. But he did make a movie and I saw it and now I'm helping him get a distributor for it. And he's also written a brilliant novel. Um, and it took him years to get up the courage to do either one of them, mm -hmm. but he's done them both and nothing's stopping you now. I mean, we're the one thing about the creative world it is it's free. You're free to think outside the box and the boxes are not like they used to be ever since Jeff Bezos came along. Um, the entire world has changed as much as it did when Gutenberg invented the printing press or, uh, you know, back in the old days when someone invented writing to take over from the oral tradition, we're going to a sea, through a sea change as big as either one of those, if not bigger. And uh, where, whereas there used to be maybe 20,000 books published every year in the United States, it's now over a million books published every year. Uh, and a lot of them are horrible. Uh, and a lot of them are really bad. But more than ever, a lot of them are good. And a lot of them are better than, you know, books that were published before. It's just the uh, statistics. You know, a lot of books means a lot of better books, too. Do you can you talk a little bit about the need for marketing and understanding marketing branding? Because you just said a million books are being published a year. So that's great. And it's a great opportunity that our stories are getting out there. But because of the just sheer number of, con of amount of content, let's not even get into video content. It'll take us 20 lifetimes to just watch what came out this week um, <laughs> alone. That's right. um, but on the book side, or just on the story side alone, without marketing, and this plays for both screenwriting, for, for novel writing, and for filmmaking, the understanding of marketing and branding to get eyeballs on your book, on your product, on your story, is more vital than ever before. And I think I find that even mediocre writers who understand marketing and branding go a lot farther than brilliant writers who have no understanding about it. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And uh, I, I wish I had your speech you just gave to, to show all of my, my author clients who, whose books we publish, mm -hmm. because I give them the same speech. And, and I, you know, if they're not willing to market, they're not going to be the ones that are visible. I mean, the, the speech that I always give is that sales depends on marketing. And there is no direct relationship between marketing and sales. There is no magic formula. But we, one thing for sure is that a book needs visibility if somebody, somebody's going to buy it. They've got to see it. And so visibility is directly related to sales because in the absence of visibility, there will be no sales. You've got to make it visible. And uh, the formula is, you know, some advertising agents, agencies talk about is, impressions and they say that you need at least four or five impressions before somebody will think about buying your product so that's why in the slick magazines you you see ads you know full page ads for bmw or hermes or um you know jose 
Cuervo tequila. It's not because there's a direct relationship between you see a BMW ad and you run out and buy a BMW. It's because you have a lasting impression from seeing an expensive ad in these magazines. And that's number one. And then you see a billboard with a BMW on it. And then you watch one go by uh, enviously. And then you, you read about one on Facebook that somebody just bought. And you, you, by the time you get up to four or five and you're needing a car, you're going to be tempted. You can't go to every showroom and look at every car. So chances are BMW is going to be up there in the in the top, you know, whatever percentage of cars you look at. And the same is true as a book. They, they say you need five impressions. So Amazon ads, Facebook ads, um, blog site tours, uh, making a, you know, making a trailer for your book, anything you can think of doing. We have services that we offer authors too, and they're things that help you get reviews. One of the primary things on Amazon is getting at least 20 reviews. And once you've got 20 to go for, you know, to, for, go for a hundred reviews. Once you go for a hundred, you go for 500. One of my novels has 400 reviews or something like that at this point. And that just means that the sales start getting serious. And they also say that, as I mentioned before, if, if you write three novels with the same character in them, you're much more likely to get a following because when somebody looks at it and they get intrigued, they think, oh, and here's two others. So if I like this one, I can come back and read a couple of others. People like to do that. They like to binge read just as they like to watch, you know, binge watch Bosch or other TV series. Um, that's the way we're doing it now. If you if you like Madam Secretary, chances are you're going to wait until the whole season is available and and sit there and watch them on a weekend, more likely than tuning in the same time every week and doing it. And we're one of our big viewing changes is that we watch things on our own time as opposed to watching them on the network's time. And I'm not sure how much longer net commercial networks are going to last given how much pressure we have on us for, for you know to use our time yeah i'm i'm I'm, no, I'm noticing that too because you know even even with even with mainline shows i mean netflix kind of ruined us with the binging situation and amazon and everything else so now like when you're watching a network show you're just like oh it's i got to wait a whole year or whatever season to watch this whole thing play out it's annoying <laughs> It's well, an, not, it, not to mention having to go through the commercials. I mean, yeah. that's it's just unbelievably annoying. I mean, I've even got to the point where you know, I I like to I like to watch the news a lot during the day. So I'll get up at you know when I get up at five o'clock and and record CNN, and I don't start watching it for a couple of hours, and that way I can go through the commercials because I I just don't have the patience to you know turn off the sound during every commercial and and they're endless. You know they seem like they last 10, 15 minutes before you get another 10 minutes of content. So that way of watching is, I think, not going to be around too many more years. I think we are going to be binge watching everything uninterruptedly. And of course, that means the economics of everything will change because the networks exist based on commercials. You can't blame them for for doing what they have to do to, to exist. But what the cables have done is come up with another financial pattern, you know, to keep them going. Now, the one thing that we all do as storytellers and as creatives, we always have to deal with something called rejection. How do you, in your opinion, how do you deal with rejection? Well, I just do so many things that uh, I don't have time to stew about it. <laughs> you know, it's like if you're, if you have that, that much out there and I, I've written about rejection many times in, in many different books and blogs and basically, rejection is not something you should spend an ounce of your emotional time on because it's, it is a, a category that is required for success. I mean, if you don't fail, and if you want to call rejection failure, if you don't fail, you're never going to succeed because everyone who's ever succeeded has done it through failing or being rejected. Mm -hmm. Just imagine if you were selling you know, vacuum sweepers from door to door if you got discouraged and had to go out for to the local bar for a drink every time you got the door slammed in your face, you would you would quickly become an alcoholic and not sell very many vacuum sweepers, right? 
<clears throat> so uh, what's interesting is in the in the book business, they actually use the word rejection. Um, but in the film business, they never use that word. I don't think I've ever heard it once. They, they simply, if they say anything, will say they're passing. Uh, more likely, they're going to say, especially to me, that the door is always open. This just doesn't fit here right now. Uh, we just got a rejection on a major series that we know we're going to sell and it, from a major company, Stars, who told us, uh, we have to pass on this right now, if you understand, but please come back here after Christmas and, and after the holidays, if you haven't set it up. And the reason has to do with you know, regime change and all kinds of things. It Politics almost never always. has to do. Yeah, it never has to do, rarely has to do with the story itself, assuming that you've got a good story. Uh, so you, you just have to get used to it. And I tell my clients that the best way to get used to it is be working on something else all the time. So your objective toward the thing you worked on before, what you have control over it is what you write. You have no control over the fate of what you've written, uh, and you shouldn't waste any time thinking about that. You know, once you've gotten it into the hands of somebody who knows what they're doing to represent it, you should simply start, you know, creating more stuff and get put together a, a whole gallery of things you've created. I, you know, I, I also there's there's an element with storytelling in general is being in the right place at the right time with the right product, and there's certain there's certain time periods that. A certain story it makes absolute sense that would never fly in today's world. I mean, I always use Blazing Saddles. Will never get made in today's <laughs> world. Many of right. Mel Brooks's movies would never get made in today's world. Um, but like I had a film that I was pitching around town uh, eight, nine years ago, which had a female lead kind of like comic booky style movie. And everybody would say, oh, you can't put a female as a lead in an action movie, that's insane. Why would you do something like that? So I was a little ahead of the curve, regardless if my story is good or not. That's, you know, but the point is just the concept of the constant thing I was saying, I heard, and there weren't many um, movies being made that had female leads, where now female lead action movies are not a big deal. I mean, depending on the type of movie it is and and so on and so forth. So I do, I do believe that, that there is a certain good timing, good place, for certain stories. Have you run across that as well? Oh yeah, I've, I, I'll never forget. I was walking down the street in New York one day and I got a phone call from a publisher and said, I am so sorry to be getting back to you. What, three years later? <laughs> is that book still available? And I said, uh, I think it is. We have some interest in it, but uh, I think it's available. And of course it was not only available, but the author had forgotten it existed. And uh, long story short, I ended up making a three book deal, you know, that day. And the author was flabbergasted because he, he had moved on to other things, as I had advised him to do. But uh, the story, you know, its timeliness had just suddenly occurred. And uh, recently I, I sold a movie that was on Up Channel on a novel that we had been trying to sell for 20 years. And there just wasn't a market for it. And we finally sold it, and it was on uh, two years ago. It finally played and did very well. And you simply would never know that it had been waiting around for 20 years like The Meg was. The Meg, the biggest movie of the last couple of years that I've done, $540 million, uh, worldwide to date, uh, that was sold 22 years ago for the first time. Mm -hmm. And it was simply in limbo all those years. Uh, going from one studio to the other, from one writer to the other, and finally got made and, you know, knocked out the box office as as I predicted it would 22 years ago. Uh, and that that just happens all the time. A story's time has come or it hasn't come. Uh, you, you can't predict, you know, whether your overnight success will happen uh, in 20 years or in, you know, overnight now, with with the Meg specifically, though, I think 22 years ago, it would not have been the same movie as they made today. Technology was just a little bit more advanced today than it was 22 years ago to put yeah, that movie and, to and life. In fact, I think that was a good thing for the movie. Uh, you know, we plus it was much less expensive than it might have been 22 years ago because the technology was is so much more advanced. And um, yeah, that that's true. So it's it's almost like every story has its own fate and its own. God in charge of it, and 
you really have to let it go the way you would a child at a certain point and make its way in the world or not. Now, with with the movie The Meg specifically, for people who don't know the the movie The Meg, was it was basically kind of like a Jaws, but with uh, a a prehistoric um, shark that was just a, a size yeah, of a skyscraper. A, a prehistoric seventy foot long shark, as opposed to a twelve foot long shark, or you know twenty foot long shark. So not only do you need a bigger boat, you need a a bigger ocean port to deal with, and uh, and, and so that. That was a, a story that led to, I think we sold seven more Meg books for Steve after the first one, and then another six or seven books that are not about Meg. So he built a whole career out of it while waiting for the movie to get finally you know, made. Is there uh, going to be a sequel? Oh, yeah, there definitely will be a sequel. As soon as uh, the U.S. Chinese financing situation gets you know, settled down, uh, both sides living in complete uncertainty every moment. Uh, that's the only impediment there there is right now to the story. Now, you obviously have pitched many studio executives. You've yourself been a studio executive. Um, or you have been a studio executive, correct? No, I, no, I no I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So you have pitched many studio executives. Um, how do you, any advice, any tips do you have to uh, pitching a studio executive your story? Well, that's a good good question because I teach pitching all the time, and um, pitching is an extremely rare opportunity because you have to be in the room with a person you know who can buy something, and that doesn't happen very often. That's why we write treatments and written pitches, because an, you know an oral pitch is is a chance. and And I learned quickly as a literary manager that at least fifty percent of the time writers are the last person you want to bring into the room to pitch their own stories because they have a very bad habit um, that they go into a trance when they start pitching. And that trance means that they may be very excited, but they're no longer in contact with the eyes of the buyer. And as a, as a professional salesman who spent all my life selling buyers in rooms, um, that's all I care about is your eyes when I'm trying to tell you a story because I can tell within a microsecond when you've lost interest in the story. And if I keep pitching you, then not only have you lost interest, but uh, it's going to be impossible to recover your interest and you're, you're creating a negative view of the story. And uh, writers don't even see that because they're in a trance. You know, they're in their own creative trance. And I, I always tell them, I'm going to kick you under the table when that happens so that you can come back to consciousness and, you know, recognize what's going on because uh, most pitches are long when they should be short. Most pitches go on for 20 minutes when they should be two minutes long uh, because the way you really sell somebody in the room is you get their attention in those two minutes and then you let them ask questions for the next 20 minutes until they're invested in the story that they, that they got intrigued by in the first two minutes. So it's a, it's a real art to be pitching, and it's something that uh, the more you think about it, the, the worse you're going to be. And I'll, I'll tell you one story. I know we have to wind down at some point, but uh, I once took a writer, a brilliant novelist who's gone on to write for television, uh, to HBO, to Michael Fuchs's office, who was the head of HBO in those days. <clears throat> and uh, we had practiced his pitch at Warner, which was the financer that partnered with me to take it in there. And we went in, said hello. There was a few minutes of chit chat. And Michael says to him, let me, let me hear the story. So this guy, despite every warning, reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a little packet of three by five cards. And Fuchs said, what, what is that? And he said, these are just my cards, you know, to prompt me. And he said, wait a minute, didn't you write this novel? And he said, yes. He said, how long did it take you? He said, uh, a couple of years. He said, you, you worked on the story for two years. You wrote a novel. It became a bestseller. And you have to use cards? Get the fuck out of my office. Sorry. Get out of my office. And we left. We left the office. That was the end of that sale. And it taught me, you know, an important thing. And every time I go to a writer's conference and talk about pitching, I tell them, you know, when you come up here to pitch, 
you are not going to have paper in front of you and you're not going to have your computer, you know, computer screen open. You're just going to look at me and tell me the story. And if you can't do that, you're not ready to do the pitch. So come back next year and, you know, when you're ready, when you know your story. So pitching is, it's got to be from the heart. It's like telling the story. Imagine, you know, you go to Thanksgiving, you sit down with your dreaded uncle because every time he wants to tell a joke, he takes out some three by five cards so he can read the joke to you. I mean, that that's exactly what, you know, it is the danger of a writer pitching. Well, I'm a writer. I need words. Words come from your heart. They don't come from your, you know, from, from your screen. Now, do you have any advice um, any advice for about protecting your work? There's so much rampant, you know, thievery or, you know, people just stealing ideas. Is there anything you could tell um, the listeners how to protect, help protect their work? Sure. I mean, first of all, I don't agree at all that there is so much rampant stealing of ideas. Okay. Uh, I, I ran across that in 30 years in the business, maybe twice. Uh, where in both cases, I'm almost sure it was totally unconscious and unintentional because people go, you know, executives go to hundreds of meetings, pitch meetings. And if an idea comes up two years later, you know, in another meeting or somebody's looking for an idea, even though they take notes during meetings and try to keep it all straight, they might not, uh, they might not remember this is where they heard it, but mostly I never see this. Uh, John Gardner, who was one of my mentors, a famous novelist, uh, said that he once had written a, a story about a giant alligator and uh, never sold it, but then found out that a movie had just been made. So he snuck into the theater and watched the movie, and he said, I almost fell to my knees after the, after the, after the movie, thanking God that my story had never been sold, because I thought, let somebody else take the rap for this hideous idea, you know, but I keep moving so fast that people can't keep up with me. And that's the way you protect yourself by moving fast, you know, and, and not worrying about it. On the other hand, if you have to have an answer to that, you there are two ways to do it. You go to the Writers Guild of America West dot org and you um, register it, register your story, register your treatment, cannot register ideas uh, or you go to the Library of Congress copyright register and a page and regis register it there. Those are about the only two legal ways to protect your story. And they don't protect your story, by the way. Um, any good attorney would want me to, to make, point this out. They protect your claim to have written the story. The truth is that American copyright, international copyright, except for China, um, immediately protects what you've written the moment it's written. You are already copyrighted. Uh, legally. But to register your copyright, you can go to the Copyright Office and register online. And that proves your claim that on this you know, particular day, you claim that you wrote the attached story. And that way, if it ever comes to court, you can show you registered this. And the only, one, only way someone could beat you in your claim is by showing they registered it two years earlier. And uh, that has happened. Some big lawsuits have been won by, you know, false claims of authorship by people who'd registered a story two years after it had already been registered by the person who really wrote, you know, the story. Uh, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't worry about it. I would spend like one thousandth of the percentage of your effort worrying about, you know, your co losing your, your rights to something. Um, spend the rest of it writing a new story. Fair enough. Now I'm going to ask you uh, a few questions I ask all of my guests. Um, what uh, what advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Um, right, just write. Um, and before you write, watch every movie you can get hold of, every movie you can see, especially your favorite ones, and read the screenplays. It's just shocking to me how many people send in things to us that indicate that they don't know anything about movies and they always start with something like you know all the movies made today are horrible they're not like they used to be which by the way isn't true there's so many contenders for the oscar in every category it's crazy i mean as somebody has to watch all these movies for the academy and and vote on them 
that is just a preposterously untrue thing. Uh, but people say it all the time, which indicates to me that they don't watch movies. Same thing I would tell a novelist, you know, don't write a novel until you've written, re read a lot of novels. And uh, that's the number, you know, watch, the, watch movies, read screenplays, and then write your screenplay. And just now, keep writing. Uh, now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? <laughs> that is such a good question. I don't, I don't know if I'm ready to answer that yet. <laughs> the lesson that took longest to learn was, uh, I guess, being disappointed that people don't do what they say they're going to do. Um, I don't think I've still learned that because I see, you know, I deal with a lot of people um, and at least half of them or more do what they say they're going to do. And, and they, you can count on it. If they say they're going to do it, they're going to do it. But the other half don't. And it just surprises me that uh, they don't. And I, I don't understand. They, they swear I am going to do this. And then they just don't do it. And uh, my brain was not constructed to, you know, either do that or understand how people can do that. So I guess that's probably it. It's it's fairly shocking that people don't do what they say they're going to do in Hollywood. I mean, I've never heard of that before. It's very shocking. Um, it's a first I've heard yeah, of things it, like that. Guess what? It you'll find it's true in the real estate <laughs> business and in the you know the architectural business and and the cookie and, and business, every business, <laughs> the cookie business. Yeah, exactly. Now, what is um, what did you learn from your biggest failure? Uh, well, I guess the, what you learn from failure is never take anything for granted and uh, and choose only the best people to work with you. And in, in particular, I would say choose people that are better than you when you work, when you're putting together a film, for example, um, in any given field of, of the film, any given department, uh, people that you can learn from. Because when you choose a weaker person that will come back to haunt you. It's guaranteed. And, you know, I have made that mistake and um, several times and I don't want to make it anymore. You know, <laughs> So that was uh, probably answered that question. Now, and what are three of your favorite films of all time? My favorite films of all time. Gee, that is that you think I, I get that question so often you'd think I'd have a pad answer to it. But uh one of them is a, a movie called Fatso, which you probably yeah, never heard of. Of course, I've heard of Fatso. It was in the 80s, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Dom DeLuise, mm -hmm. written, directed, and starred in by Anne Bancroft, uh, Mel, Mel, you know, Mel Brooks's uh, wife, uh, one of my all time favorite movies. And, uh, and, and you mentioned The Usual Suspects. I definitely would put that up there somewhere. The Pawnbroker, uh, mm -hmm. one of the most unforgettable movies I've seen. Uh, I could watch it over and over again. Um, I, I, I love Life or Something Like It, one of the movies that I made. Um, I, I think it's still a good movie. I watch it on airlines whenever I can. Uh, it's just extremely charming. Ed, Ed Burns, Angelina Jolie. Um, but uh, yeah, there's so many great movies. I, I kind of hate the question because it makes me choose when, in fact, I'd rather give you a list of 100 Sure. Um, sure. It's like you choosing know. your it's like choosing your favorite kid. Yeah, exactly. You're not supposed to do that, right? <laughs> that's what they that's what they say. Um yeah. now is there anything you want anything you're working on anything any new books uh any new courses things like that you can talk uh, to the audience about? Well, I just finished a book a few months ago called Tell Your Story to the World and Sell It for Millions uh because I realized that you know having learned to do, do storytelling on the front porches of Louisiana um my Cajun relatives who could come out and get you in laughter within seconds and others could put you asleep within seconds who didn't know how to tell stories. Uh, I, I, I realized that there was no book that exactly showed you how to get from the front porch or the dining room table, you know, all the way to signing a deal that could be worth millions. And that's what the book tries to do. I wrote it with my vice president of Story Merchant called Lisa Sarasoli. We both had wanted to write a book like this. And so it just came out a few months ago. And it basically takes you from A to Z. And I'm really happy with that one. 
Very cool. And uh, and where can people find out more about you and the work you're doing? Uh, my main website of the four or five companies that I run serving writers in various capacities, the main uh, website is storymerchant.com because it kind of shows you what all the different companies are and it leads you from one to the other. And it shows you uh, the movies and things that we've done and that we're proud of and some of the movies that we're planning to do and series that we've set up. Very cool. Ken, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, my friend. Thank you for dropping the knowledge well, bombs on you. the tribe today. Yeah. Yeah.